Hello, my name is Russell Hill from Trout Fisherman magazine and I'm here to welcome you to Modern Stillwater Tactics Volume 2 where we'll be looking at alternative early season methods for catching trout on still waters. We'll be visiting a number of the top Midland reservoirs with well-known contributors Gareth Jones from Airflow and former world champion Ian Barr. Early season fishing isn't always easy because the conditions can be tough but with the right advice and proper tackle you can be well on your way to some good sport. Hi there, welcome to Draycott Water. It's early season and it's pretty busy on the bank here. Now we all know the usual tactics for the start of the season, the fast sinking lines, boobies, dog nobblers. But today what I'd like to do is to show you some alternative techniques for catching fish from the shore. Okay, I'm just about to make a first couple of casts. My team for the, for the first couple of casts is gonna be a orange blob top dropper, something to draw the fish into the, to the other flies. A lot of fresh stockfish about as well, I'd imagine they've eaten it. Behind it I've got a, a gel bark with a green head, again half nymphy, half stocky and on the point I've got a black and green um, tadpole pattern. Very important with the tadpole pattern though, it's got a, a layer of lead on it so I can get my flies down to the fish's depth without having to use a sinking line. So cast out. And one thing everybody should try and do is to make sure you turn the flies over. It may not cast as far, but it's very important that the flies are fishing on the drop. Turn it over and it's always going to be fishing. Otherwise, you'll end up having to give it two or three pulls with the flies back on themselves. You won't feel the takes if the fish take on the drop. I'm fishing into about seven, eight feet of water here. So I'm going to give it about a five or ten second count and then just start figure eight with a couple of little twitches and a few pauses just to see if I can get a, a reaction. As I was saying, it's very important to make sure that the, the fly turns over, give yourself maximum range and also make sure the fly is fishing from the off. When I've let the fly sink to death, I like to give it two or three pulls. That'll make sure that any fish in the area that's taking a look at it thinks it's going to get away. So it'll draw them onto the flies. Then, oh, <laughs> exactly as I said it, just slow down the retrieve. And he's still there, he's still there. Just speed it up and come up on the hang, see if I can get him to eat just on the edge of the drop off. Very important to hang your flies at the end. It's generally accepted as a, as a boat fishing technique, but when you've got a, a drop off maybe 10, 15 feet out, it's a perfect place to hang your flies, drop them back down to depth, and a lot of fish will just eat as you're about to lift off. Just add a little bump, and often if you pause, yeah, there he is again. Yeah, I got him. <laughs> oh. He's a jumper. <laughs> now that fish had tapped the flies on the drop and had a few little bumps and pulls all the way through. And it's just a case of hanging it there a lot of the times in front of them, just allowing them enough time to make a decision. If you keep on retrieving, a lot of the times you'll just get a tap, 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 and you, you won't actually hook the fish. Good strong fish, these, these dry cod fish. Well, he's had the black and green tadpole, absolutely deadly pattern early season. Um, I tie mine with a, a layer of lead on, and by tying them with a layer of lead, okay, just like, keep them in the water and just gently release him. And hook, and he's away.
Again, the black and green hooked firmly in the scissors this time. As you see, that extra little pause just on the drop allowed the fly to go in. Here we go. And a lovely Draycott trout to hand. Beautiful fish. Early season stock fish at their best. And the black and green firmly in the scissors. Just remove the black and green and put this guy back to fight another day. Well, I've just hooked up on the hang and this guy is shot off into open water. He's not a happy bunny. Um, again, on the black and green as it dropped back. But this one's a lot more powerful. Now, I don't know if it's a, a slightly bigger stock fish or if it could be one of the overwintered fish. It's, uh, it's definitely putting in a good performance. So strong, these raycock fish, so strong. As you can see, there's a lot of people fishing this shoreline and what will tend to happen is that the fish will start to move out from shore. If everybody starts to wade, then it'll just push the fish further out and we'll all have to cast further. So I've let the fly settle and I like to give it the three big long pulls. Oh, there you go, and he's taking it on the drop. <laughs> Brilliant. Oh, good fish too. What's he taking? I think he's actually taking the nymph. So I've, I've gone down now, I've put a, a much smaller fly on the point, a little cormorant. But this guy must have been drawn into the, to the blob, took a look, thought, ooh, I don't like the orange fly. But it did draw him into the zone where he saw the little black jowl. And he's nailed that on the drop, lovely. The black jowl's got a little green head, just a little hot spot. Again, early season, it's a, something just to draw them into. Okay, <laughs> it's coming up the inside. Okay. <laughs> there you go. A great little rainbow trout. A handy little tip here is to turn the fish upside down when you're releasing it. Uh, the fish will just, just hold solid. Uh, won't thrash around and make it really difficult for you to release. As you can see in the corner of the mouth, the little black jowl claimed another victim today. <laughs> Just keep his head under the water, keep him going, release the hook, turn him back and he'll be ready to go. There you go. Lovely little fish. I'm on probably the most difficult place to fish today and there's a big reason for that. And that is everybody else is over there with the wind on their, on their backs. A lot of fish are going to be feeding on this, um, on this downwind shore. I can see a lot of midge hatching off and it's all about lack of pressure. So if there's less fishermen and there's an equal amount of fish, there's more for you. Missed him again. <laughs> They're just starting to play with the, the tadpole and not really eating it. What I think I'm going to do is I'm actually going to reduce the size of the flies, put something a little smaller on and see if I can get them to eat it. Maybe something a bit more natural. Well, the line I'm fishing today is a 12 foot fast intermediate tip. What this line does on a windy day... Oh, I've just talked one on the hang again. <laughs> just goes to show that you've got to take real care on the hang not to pull the flies out too soon. <laughs> Those fish follow her in right at the edge and love to eat that fly right on the shore. Get them a little closer in. And we'll release this. As I was saying before, I was interrupted by that fish. 
This line has got a 12 foot intermediate tip, making it perfect for fishing in 10, 12 feet of water. What I like about this line is that unlike a full intermediate that sinks all the way to the bottom, this line will hold the depth. So once you've cast out, even on a slow retrieve, you can hold it at a level or give it a few pulls, draw the flies back up towards the surface and drop them back down again, giving you a lot more control. A big advantage of these tip type lines is that on a side wind, it actually slows down the line's drift. A full floating line, would, you'd have to mend and mend and mend to keep control over the line. Whereas with the extra um, tip section, just biting in, slows down the speed and helps you keep it in the zone for longer. With this wind coming across my wrong shoulder today, I'm using a relatively short leader. Just six foot for the first dropper and then a further five feet between each of the flies. I'm actually using quite a heavy tipper today. I'm on 11.2 pounds uh, sight free G5. Um, the reason being with so many fish around and the chances of double hookups, I don't want to be leaving flies behind in fish and it's not really affecting the number of takes I'm getting today. Later on in the season, when the fishing is more tricky, I'll drop down in diameter. But for this early season fishing, stay on 2x. Well, today we've been fishing a mix of, of lures and imitative patterns. Um, we've had a blob on the top dropper, bright pink, bright orange, really dragging the fish into the zone, taking a look at the other flies on the cast. On the middle dropper, we've been fishing with a, a variation on the, on the Delbach. Black body, green head, so it's kind of a mixture Montana stroke Delbach. Been great for the stockfish and picking up one or two of the silver, more silver, cleaner fish. Finally, on the point, we've had a mixture of a leaded tadpole and, and as the day wore on and the fish got a little bit more cagey, we've been fishing with a, a little jungle cock cormorant. Now the jungle cock cormorant has been fantastic on the hang. As you draw the flies into the edge and just hold them at the end, anything that's following the blob, turning back, that fluttering wing has just been really, really enticing these fish and they've been nailing that on the drop back. I was waiting for that to happen. Early season with the stockfish potted up, I've gone and hooked myself two fish. I've got a, a rainbow on the top drop on the blob, and I can see another one on the point fly, 12 feet away on the cormorant. So let's try and get the, the top drop of fish close to hand and just gently, gently release it. Try not to get yourself hooked, hooked up. Okay, again, turn him over. Oh, that is a good fish. That is a cracking, solid fish. Okay, so there's number one. Put him back, lift the rod, see if our friend is there. <laughs> We've still got a number two on the point. There you go, he's taking on the cormorant. Again, get yourself underneath him. Again, turn him over, turn him onto his back, and hook, and release. On the hang again. <laughs> that hang is absolutely devastating today. I'd say about 80% of the takes I've had have all come right under the rod tip. You know, you're just making that nice little sweep with the rod tip just to bring the top dropper up onto the surface and just watch it go. <laughs> again, that cormorant. Marabou wing, as it's falling back, I'm sure it's just giving them that real life. Very attractive to these fresh rainbows. Just 
get it. Oh, he's just lightly hooked in the scissors. I'll just get that fish turned over. Again, turn him upside down. <laughs> it's a great little trick, that. Again, in the corner of mouth, the cormorant. That black marabou wing just dances on the end there. Let's just get him unhooked. Clean off. Spin him over. And away to go. Our mini tip lines have only been in the range for a couple of seasons, but they're already my firm favourites. Fish will often cruise at a set depth, and by being able to maintain that depth, you'll catch a lot more fish. We've got a choice of 3 foot, 6 foot and 12 foot tips that'll help you find that level and keep you catching all day long. Today I'm using the uh, 3 foot fast tip just to get it bedded in, just want to get the fly below the surface and slow the drift round. In the bag here you can see I've got a 6 foot fast tip, a 12 foot fast tip for when you really want to get deep, when you're looking for a real deep presentation. Often in high summer the fish will go deep and you can get them deep on buzzers. Um, my personal favourite for, for fish high in the water column, I like the 12 foot slow tip. Fantastic booby line, really good for the washing line and gives you direct control. Finally you've got a, a 6 foot slow tip. Now that's like your old floater that got beaten up at the front end and used to bite in. Um, when a fish high in the water column but you want to avoid any wake, that's a fantastic line. Hi there, welcome to Farmo. You've joined us on a freezing cold winter's day and I'd like to show you some techniques that'll make your time on the water far more productive. On the surface, a concrete bowl looks pretty featureless. It's just a mass of grey concrete and a piece of water. Not much to look at, but underneath is where it all happens. More so than any other water, the wind has a massive effect on fish location. As you can see, the wind here is getting up now and this will push the cooler water on the surface down the wind. And that water is then forced back up the lake on what's known as the undertow. This undertow can have a major effect on choosing location to fish, and the movement or the flow of water actually affects the direction in which the fish will feed into the prevailing current. If you imagine in the summer when the fish are on the surface, we always expect them to come swimming up the wind intercepting food. Now the same is true in the depths of winter, only this time the fish are on the bottom, feeding hard, and they'll feed in the opposite direction. Okay, I'm setting up the double booby. And one, one of the little tricks we've got going on here is a knot we call the Rapala knot. Now the Rapala knot gives the fly a heck of a lot more movement coming through the water. It's, um, it's actually like a little hangman's noose. Um, and that slack in the system just gives a heck of a good wiggle and a lot more life. With the temperature well below freezing last night, I'm expecting these fish to be deep. So, even with the DI8 line, which sinks at 8 inches per second, you're still looking at counts of over a minute to reach full depth. When the fish are lethargic and on the bottom, you've really got to tease them into taking the fly. Um, a lot of times it's a slow figure of eight with a little twitch of the rod tip. Uh, often then I'll give it a little strip on a pause, just something so the flies will come up and bounce off the bottom, and that'll be enough just to to trigger the take. Big problem with booby fishing is you miss a lot of fish. And that's down to a couple of things, but you know, when you've got cold conditions, they're not eating as hard. I've got a, a couple of boobies on, uh, two different colours, again spaced about seven feet apart. Uh, I've got a black and green with a little bit of colour in it, a little orange collar on it, something that will attract the more recently stocked fish. Um, I've also got a, a pale pink fly on the point, which I've found really does well with some of the overwintered fish. Now, 
They could be taking it for a fry, or they could be taking it for, I guess, rotting fish flesh. Either way, it's one of those flies that really sorts out the, the better quality older, older fish. One of the other things as well is patience. You've got to allow that fly to settle on the bottom. You'll get tension on the line because the running line will hit the, the concrete bank, but the, the actual head hasn't hit the bottom yet. It's just that tension there. So do give it the full count to get it onto the bottom before you start your retrieve. A lot of people would think um, a 14 foot leader isn't going to keep your flies on the bottom. But there's a couple of factors here. One is that it isn't coming up vertically off the end of the line, there's an angle to it. The speed retriever is going to pull the flies down. Second thing is that there's a situation called the undertow. Now the stronger the wind on the surface, the stronger the undertow going along the bottom of the lake. And that also has the effect of pushing your leader over on its side. So in a really strong undertow, I'll use leaders of up to 20 feet just to keep them above the weed and uh, in the right zone. I've just missed a couple and um, I'm finding these fish are just snatching at us just coming up the shelf. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Got that one. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> They've been really messing me about for the last 10 minutes. Just going to net this one. It's a nice clean fish. Not a huge one, but a good start of the day. A couple of pounds, taking the pink. Right in the scissors with the pink. Just pop it out. Put him back in the net. In the water to revive. And then turn him over. There you go. And he's swimming off. Lovely. Good strong fish. Casting long distance is what's going to make the difference during the day. One little cheat that can help anybody achieve more distance is to actually throw slack into the line after the cast has landed. If you imagine, if you hold tight, the line's going to pendle them down to the bottom at the same distance out as it landed. So you're actually going to reduce the distance between where it landed and where it lands on the floor. By throwing slack line, it's going to sink vertically and hit the bottom another two or three yards further out. All little things that can help make a difference during your day. setup that we generally use on the shore, 10 foot 8 weight, quite powerful rod, you know, a large arbor reel is going to look after your, your running line and then we've got on the end a, um, a custom cut 40 plus, it's a DI8 sinking line, it's 55 foot head but then you can cut it back to whatever length you want. The DI8 makes a big difference, it's going to get you down onto the deck far quicker than anything else out there on the market. Very often the fish will take at exactly the same point in the retrieve. Um, you know, you'll probably see that some days it'll be a 10 feet of, of orange running line and, and you just want to be aware of that, you know, focus into that. It's probably the depth that they're very happy swimming up and down on the contour. Uh, but, you know, just focusing in on those moments will really help sharpen you up. Yeah, it's important, always have a long handle landing net on the bank here. You don't want to be down close to the water's edge. Just pulling them in, taking the stickleback pattern. Taking a lovely little stickle back, flat back gurgler. Nailed it. He pulled it a couple of times on the retrieve. Nailed it on the second one.
new line for 2016 is our custom cut Die 8 40 plus designed specifically for concrete bowls and booby fishing with a massive 55 foot head weighing 400 grains this is not the line for your seven weight rod but being a custom line with this level head you cut back from the tip end to get the perfect weight to balance your outfit this has got to be my all-time favorite line for bank fishing in places like far more in the depths of winter the fish are going to be on the bottom in 40 foot of water and you need to get there fast at eight inches per second this line is the fastest sinker on the market not only that but it's also built on a low stretch core so when you cast out 40 to 50 yards with this line you're going to be able to set the hook and feel those takes at long distance as a rough guide on a seven weight rod i'd be looking at between 35 and 40 feet of line then on your eight weight around 40 to 42 43 feet and then if you're going to really go for it on a nine weight or ten weight rod then you can go up to the full 55 foot but that'll depend on your your casting ability as well you need to generate some high line speed to keep this line moving Well, the line I'm using here is the Bandit. It's uh, quite an interesting line. It wasn't developed as a UK line. It was actually developed for the New Zealand market, where camouflage and lack of line flash is a huge factor. So, why am I using a camouflage New Zealand line on still water? Sounds crazy. Not quite. This line has got a unique section at the front where the first 10 feet is banded, and you've got light bars and dark bars. Those bars allow me to watch the line tip for movement, showing up every little tweak on the line when the fish hits the fly. The Bandit is part of our Super Dry series and is available in weight forward profile from sizes four through to eight. New in the range for the season is a camo cord intermediate line. Now, when we say camo cord, we've got a clear coating on the outside, and inside we've got a mottled core, it goes from brown to olive to black and should blend in well, especially on some weedy small still waters. With the PU outer, what you have is a very, very tough coating and a very, very slick line. So I think this is going to be a firm favourite of all the small still water guys. Yeah, as you can see, it's an ultra supple line, really, really smooth and just doesn't want to spring and create any memory. You know, a lot of monocord lines are very, very stiff and uh, not nice to handle, especially in the depths of winter. But it's, a, you know, six or seven degrees today, and this line is just ultra supple. The camo cord line comes with welded loops, a tip and butt. Ultra smooth and very, very strong. As you can see, we've got a, a wind running from left to right here, and my cast is going across the wind. Now, if I was on a floating line and light nymphs, the line would just push around too quickly, and I'd be trying to mend, trying to mend desperately to keep depth. But what I've done is I've put on a three foot mini tip. Now, what that does is that intermediate tip section, it just bites into the surface and anchors the flies. It doesn't matter what density of line I'm fishing, whether it's a floating line or a sinking line. I still like to count my flies down to depth. Now, it sounds crazy on a floating line that you're gonna count your flies down, but it, when you're fishing deep buzzer, it'll stop you fishing over depth and catching the bottom. Another little technique which we, you know, both me and Ian really, really enjoy is that long pull. That long pull gives a very smooth lift up off the bottom and gives vertical movement to the flies. It's absolutely deadly. And what you can do is you, to get the flies back to drop back down, follow up with a little mend, throw slack line into the system and just wait for that line to draw off, watching the rod tip all the time, just for another take.
Adrian. We're on the shore here, pits for early season, looking for some deep buzzer fishing. Yeah, and we're, we're doing plenty of that, Gareth, but unfortunately uh, the fish aren't playing game too much. No, I think this northeast wind we've got today has really, really slowed the sport down. Yeah, it's, we, well, we've had what, five or six, well, three each. We've had three each, we've had six, and there's it's certainly... Not it's not a competition. Oh, we always compete, me and you. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's cold, but there are one or two buzzers coming off, and I'm hoping... 11, 12 o'clock, if we're not there already, that something may happen. Yeah, you can see a few midge coming off on the edges here. As you say, as that pushes out, maybe it'll draw a few more fish into the edges. That's what we're hoping for. Yeah. Well, we're in the warmest part of the lake, Ian. Got the wind on our back and uh, lucked out another fish on the blob. <laughs> the blob? Well... So why have you got a blob on, Gareth? Well, I'm supposed to be doing a deep water buzzer feature, but... Uh, I just like putting the blob in the top dropper just to draw any fish in. Yep. A lot of people often you not know, catch on it and take it off, but it's that that's drawing it in. It's drawing a lot of fish and also it works so well on the slow retrieve. Yep. It really does work well. And you find you catch a lot of fish on the buzzer next to the blob? Definitely. And, and I'll also position the blob at different parts of the cast. Yep. A lot of people think, oh, well, it's just a top dropper fly or a yep. point fly. I really like it on the second dropper. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Either side. So they've always got something close by to yep. grab onto. So Ian, um, you've got a obviously you're on a floating line there. I yep. can see you're still using the blitz rod after seeing me using Ron and Blagden last year. Oh, How are you getting on with it? Oh Gareth, I absolutely love it. What a dream. It's it's just so powerful yet you don't know you're holding it. It's dead, dead light. Well that's the plan. The plan is it's very, very light in the tip. And also it's quite a smooth action I, I find, which is great, you know, even with some quite fine tippet. You don't don't snap sure, off yeah. fish and I, I very rarely go with eight pound anyway, uh, okay. and I eat fish hard. Yeah, yeah. And like you say, the rod, the rod absorbs it. Um, you don't get a break. It's not too stiff, and it's it, it, it actually is a good all-round rod. You know, I, I'm a com competitor, as you know, and I use this for my nymphs, my dries, my die sevens, and my die eights. And you need that to do everything. Sure. Whether you're a pleasure angler on the bank or a competition angler with a fast sinking line, the Blitz is just it's it's made the perfect rod. I think also another thing that we've, uh, we've that both affects us is that we're using a lot of barbless hooks now. Yep. And I think that the smoother action rods, when you get those fish on barbless hooks close into the edge, yep. you don't get those fish bounce off at yeah. the end. Yeah. You know, and there's a lot of matches mm. which can be won, won or lost by a yeah. less than a fish. I tell you, what, I try what's made a big difference to me with the blitz is is fishing the hang. Like okay. you talked about the bounce and the not bounce off. The rod goes with it. Yeah. Okay. So you've not got that knock action. When the hook will spring, it just goes in, hook stays in, That's and you lose a lot, lot less fish. That's interesting. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you're enjoying it. I'm loving it. Good man. Not all anglers are hardcore competition fishermen like myself. And if you prefer a little bit of comfort, then the airflow rock stool is just the job. For the chair, we've got this really nice neoprene padded section. Lovely backrest, very, very comfortable to sit on. Then you've got two compartments, one front, one back. Large enough for your couple of reels. Actually, with, with your sandwiches and your flask in the back, you got everything for a nice little session on the bank. Airflow Sight Free has long been the UK's favourite fluorocarbon. From the original Sight Free to more recently, G3 has become a real firm favourite. As with all things, technology moves forward, and for 2016, we'll be offering two new versions of our Sight Free product. The new Sight Free G4 is slimmer than diameter for a given breaking strain. Not only is it slimmer than diameter, but it's also more supple. So, for general buzzer techniques and nymph techniques where you, you want to present the flies with a little bit more life, then this is going to be perfect for it. Sight3 G5, this is our premium product, and I've really enjoyed testing this last year. It's a really, really strong product, uh, and very, very fine for its diameter. Sight3 G5 is approximately 30% slimmer in diameter for a given breaking strain, which is a huge advantage on any water. There are some occasions when fluorocarbon can be a, a slight disadvantage, especially when fish are feeding high in the water column, and feeding close to the surface. It's at times like these I turn to a tactical core polymer. 
The tactical core polymer is perfect for dry fly and light nymph fishing. Our new tipper program comes on these unique interlocking spools, which will allow you to create a stack of tippet of any breaking strain or diameter and interlock them together. You'll also notice that the spools are colour coded. Green for the G5, orange for the G4 and yellow for the tactical tippet. On the side you'll see that we've got these unique colour bands. They're all printed up with the tipper diameter, brake strain, so it's very easy for you to see what you've got on the spool. Finally at the front you'll see a unique little cutout and that allows you to quickly see how much tippet you've got left on the spool when you're out on the water. Looks like it's taking a size 12 barbless crisp on the top drop end. It's actually looks like a cracking little overwintered fish. Very lean, always a sign this time of year. You're looking for the, the stockies that got the bigger bellies, but this one's very long and very lean, so definitely an overwintered fish with a full shovel of a tail. Absolutely beautiful. This beautiful little sleek overwintered rainbow here from Pittsford um, took a small little size 12 red butt buzzer on the top dropper uh, indicating that the fish may be coming up because the last couple of fish have taken the point fly slightly deeper but this one top dropper beautiful long and lean until it's overwintered the stock has uh, got a deeper belly and this has got the bluey silver rays in its tail classic overwintered beautiful litter fish buzzer starting to hatch don't be afraid of the buzzers early season don't just stick with the lures because the small buzzers is what they're feeding on and they'll readily take them. That beautiful uh, overwintered fish, typical early season. We've got a bit of a crosswind here, and what I've been doing is putting the line across the wind, giving it a natural descent, and just letting those buzzers come round in the wind, and almost literally just keeping the line and fly static. Natural movement would be by the current out in the water there. Again, you're, you're allowing the flies to drop towards the bottom. I get it's still quite cold. It's, bit of a chilly breeze, so to let your fly subtly drop deep. I'm fishing a, um, a straight floating line. Um, I've got about 18 foot of eight pound fluorocarbon. Um, fishing the float because the, the fish are quite close into the bank. Uh, the tip line I think will just take it down a little bit too quickly and start hitting and snagging on the bottom. Um, if in deeper water the tip line's great, again that little three foot tip just bites in, gives great control and a, a nice little angle for the lift, but these fish are pretty close, seem to be quite higher up, they're taking the top dropper, so the floating line is ideal. And the good thing about this static cross the wind buzzer fishing, grease your end of your, leader, end of your fly line up and you actually watch the fly line start moving before you feel anything at your fingertips often key and you'll pick up extra fish throughout the day that you won't even know were there normally. Like that one I just missed. Many people with nymph fishing will tend to do what we call a figure of eight, keep moving it with buzzers as well. The best way to fish buzzers and nymphs is absolutely motionless. The way I tend to fish them is put them out across the wind let them settle down to 15, 20 seconds, and every now and again, just do a long, slow draw like this. Lifts the buzzers up off the bottom, and it allows them just to naturally descend back down again. You may be doing a slow figure of eight, but sometimes it has to be absolutely motionless before they look at it. It's key to successful buzzer and nymph fishing. Dead, dead, dead slow lift and then just drop it back by leaving it static. A lot of fish tend to take it as, as you lift it, as you pull it and it, as soon as you stop and they start to descend down everything goes tight. You do nothing with it, you just literally hold on to your line, almost put your left hand in your pocket if you're right handed so you can't do anything with it and the fish will shock themselves.
Well, after committing the cardinal sin on the last cast, where I knew I had a win knot on the cast and I still carried on, just got broken, so I'm a bit disappointed with myself for that one. Um, so I've had to retie my leader up. I've got four fly cast. I've got about six foot to the first dropper. I've got a little jowl bar. Then next one down, another four foot. I've got a small glue with an orange thorax. Again, a small glue on the on the dropper, four feet away, and then another four feet away. I've got quite a heavy glue. Black, orange thorax again. These is early season, generally going to be black. Uh, so hopefully you're going to imitate what's out there. A lovely clean fish this one. Again, I always like to keep them upside down when they're in the hand, stops them from jumping around, lets it easy for the release. And in the corner of the mouth, a little black buzzer. So, I'm gonna put this one back to fight another day. Cracking little fish. After a year on the market, our blitz rods have been a real favorite out there. The rod was developed as two stages. One is a 10 foot seven weight, which is the top of the water rod. And for, you know, for bank work and, and deep sunk work, a 10 foot eight weight. I know Ian really likes the 10 foot eight weight for everything. But for me, I feel that that smoother action on the seven weight just makes a difference on finer tip butts and top of the water sport. Working with the UK's premium rod manufacturer, we were able to pick the components that we wanted on this blank. From the ultra lightweight anodized reel seat, the floor grade cork handle, the ultra lightweight pack bay rings throughout, the rod just oozes quality. We have the simple overfit ferrules, which have been reinforced for improved strength and durability. All these things combine to make the Blitz rod a real winner. Well, Ian, thanks for loaning me a few of your flies today. Very kind of you. Hopefully they've worked for you, Gareth. Yeah, I've had a few of them. Really enjoyed your little woofter buzzer. That's yeah. been, a, been a good pattern for me today. Yeah, that little pink thorax buzzer for me, it's phenomenal. Um, especially on Grafham, it stands out. And I'll be honest, I don't know why, but that little pink thorax drives them crazy and they go mad for it. And they will pick it out on a cast of four. Sure. I see also you've got a lot of quill buzzers there. Yeah, you, the, the quills get the perfect segments for the, for the natural buzzer. It's, it's the best way to imitate it. And for me, there's no other way. Yeah. I see also you've tied a lot of um, your hooks on a lot of different weights as well. Yeah, that's important, Gareth, because early season we want to get down deep and you want to save time. You'll get down quick and as fast as possible. So a heavier hook weight, you know, in competitions we're not allowed lead or stuff like that, but a heavier hook, a few layers of varnish. Yeah. Like a little mini bomb. It is, and there's no drag, is there? So it really sinks quickly. It really gets down quickly to where the fish are. Well, Ian, it's good to catch you up again. Yes. All the best time spent in the bar. Always is, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Well, look, we've got better conditions today than we did on the water. But what we'd like to do today is just to tell the, the, the viewers what we what we got up to on the water, you know. And as a competitive angler, I'm sure you'll agree. A lot of the time, the debrief after actually gives us more information than mm. what we what we had out in the water on the day, you know. It's like the team meetings, isn't it? Yeah, it all yeah. comes out. It all is going to come out. So, tell me what you were up to at Pittsford. Well, as you said, it was much much cooler. So I, I kind of gathered the fish would be slightly deeper, and we had a, a good left to right breeze. So I, I decided to anchor some deep buzzers. Mm. Uh, with a little bit of a sly fly on the point. I put on one of my favourite little candy blobs. Yeah. Um, it's a great early season fly. It's a great all year round fly for Daphnia, but it, it's also a trigger point. What was quite clear 
uh, and I think we mentioned it on the day, we noticed that the fish that took the buzzer most took the one nearest to the lure. Sure. So they sure. weren't all taking the blob, but it's there as that, hello, I'm here type thing. Sure. It's an interesting point you're making there about the water clarity. In. You know, early season, a lot of times you get a lot of water comes in, from rainwater up in the mountains and colours up the water. Um, trout are sight feeders. Yeah, it's absolutely. Just... They've got to be able to see what they're going to eat. And water clarity is so important. You know, clear water, nothing too scary, or certainly only one scary, you know, when it's talk scary, like a brighter colour. Uh, distance is important. If the water's murkier, you can have your flies closer. Sure. The clearer, you tend to put them further apart, and that's quite a key point. Now, when you're in the murky water, are you, are you a fan of the colours or are you a fan of black? Black. Yeah, yeah, me black, too. Black stands out. If you get that milky coffee colour, mm. if you get the deep, peaty, dark colours, then your cat's whiskers, your white and yellows, your sunbursts. But in that, the general milky water that you tend to get with rainfall, black. Yeah. Well, we were lucky, as I say, we got that clear water top of the wind there, and uh, we were able to get a few fish on. Not only the blobs, but also on the buzzers. Yeah, for me, early, early season, especially from the bank, you know, it's a natural food source. You're not going to get follows. They're just going to nail it and eat it. Yeah. Uh, three, three deep buzzers with a, with a candy on the point, just dead drifting it across in a, in a perfect left to right wind. It's, it's what we go fishing for. Yeah, that take is just everything, isn't it? Yeah. You get that real solid good lock up and bang. So I was fishing the three deep buzzers with the blob on the point, and we had the perfect left to right wind. and the heavy epoxy buzzers, so they're going to anchor down. Sure. They're not going to drift too quick. They're going to drift perfect. Put a little mend in and just let them naturally come round in the wind and just watch for that take. Now, what I tend to do is allow the buzzers to drop and give them that long, slow lift and draw, which you'll see on the video where we lift it and the buzzers naturally come up like that and then they stop and then they just sink down. And that's more often when you'll get your take. It's just phenomenal. Now, were you throwing a mend in then to get, to, to get a little bit more depth at that point yep, or are you so, just holding tight? Sure, so never chuck your line straight out early season if you want the depth because they're just going to spin round they're going to drift unnaturally and you're not going to get the depth as you throw it out i simply just draw a little circle with my right hand as i'm casting that puts a nice little mend in the line and that mend is natural slack which once it catches up the line then it will start to pull your flies around but you've got that seven eight ten seconds for your flies to get down to the right depth and we're, we're talking six to twelve foot water maximum this time of year so you haven't got to let it go down too long sure sure well my tactics were very similar to yours ian i was on a on a little mini tip line or just to bite in and create that anchor point and just slow that drift round. One of the other things I noticed on every day that we filmed was the amount of fish that were coming on the hang. Sure. Now, you know, everybody fishes the hang from the boat, that's normal technique. But fishing the hang from the shore, I reckon maybe 60% of the fish took at that last little point. And um, one of the, my favorite things to do is uh, when I'm getting close to the edge, is just to sweep the rod tip up and then when I come on the hang, I actually push the rod out to the side. Now what that does is actually takes the flies away from your vision, uh, mm. from, from from the fish looking at you. I just love those takes. I, don't know I did you. notice you caught a few doing that, Gareth. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, you know, it's it's something if you don't do, how many people have lifted off and have seen a boil? And, yeah. and they've gone, oh, Mr. Fish, Mr. Fish. That fish is following all the time, you know, and you've just got to take advantage of it. And those. you're right, it's, it's often associated with boat fishing and certainly with lures as well, but hang your nymphs there's yeah. nothing more better than some buzzers just hanging there in that taking zone exactly well if you think of the way that the buzzer actually moves to the water column they actually go vertically mm -hmm. and actually when you get to that point in the retrieve is the most natural movement you're going to get so mm -hmm. yeah it's, it's it's an absolutely deadly fishing technique and one i yeah. recommend to everybody you've got a cracking selection of buzzers here ian um tell tell me what you, which ones you choose and why well you see that they're all they're all a nice dark color they're all black buzzers but you'll see variations with certain trigger points. Sure. Uh, one of my favorites has to be the red butt buzzer. Um, okay. If you look at the natural, you'll see little burst blood vessels at the rear ends, and that's what we're trying to imitate. And it's also a, a trigger point. Um, and then you'll see this one here, it's called the woofter. Okay, um, it's quite pop, a bright, bright thorax on it. Yeah, it's, it's a pinky color, hence the name okay. woofter. Yeah. Um, probably one of my best and most consistent buzzers the last five, six seasons. Really, wow. Um, not sure why the pink works, but it is absolutely deadly. I see also these are all epoxy buzzers. Yeah, sure. The, the epoxy buzzer, they, they cut through quickly. It's all about getting depth and getting there. You know, being a competitor, I want to be at the right depth. I want to be there quickly. Sure. Uh, and the epoxy buzzer would just slice straight through. Yeah. Minimal resistance in the water, straight and to the bottom. I, I see you've got some tied on slightly heavy hooks as well. Yeah, yeah. Again, the hooks uh, will, will determine the, the speed of uh, descent. 
Sure. Um, early season, I tend to be on four heavyweights, okay. you know, a, a very heavy 10 or size eight grub hook. Again, slice through and down that bottom of the water, five, six seconds quicker than, than my competitor. Sure. I'm often asked what's the most important thing when you go fishing, and for me, the trout eat the fly, so it has to be right. So your choice has to be right, and the quality needs to be right. And also, what's attached to that fly as you tip it. Sure. So you can get other brands of fluorocarbon, which, which are you know, they're quite thick, and it, the fly just won't sit right. So sure. choosing the right tippet and choosing the right fly are probably two of the most critical things. The fly is what they eat, and the tippet is what it's attached to. If you get those wrong, you could be in for a tough day. Yeah, you're right, Dan. You're right. Well, that was a nice little match, Ian, on the bank. I knew with two competitor anglers, we couldn't have uh, couldn't have had it any other way. No, uh, nine all, I believe. Yeah, England, Wales, another draw. Yeah. Last cast again, Gareth. Well, the wife did phone and let me get the the drop back fish on the phone, so <laughs> I'll thank her for that. Well, what I think we should do is to obviously thank the viewers for watching, and uh, I think we should take her up in the summer and have a day in the boat. I think that's uh, game on. I think. Yeah. Cheers, Ian. Thanks for all your help with the film. No problem, Gareth.